Uh, yeah, our next speaker um, is Daniel Siladi from uh, Université de Paris, and he's going to talk about quantum algorithms for second order cone programming and support vector machines. Uh, Daniel. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in. I'm going to present some uh, joint work with uh, Jordanis Karenidis and Anupam Prakash. Uh, you can see the link to the archive paper here on the title slide, and the slides are also in the Slack. So whoever wants to follow along can follow there as well. So uh, where are we in the grand, uh, grand scheme of things? Uh, most of you probably all uh, probably know about linear programming and semi-definite programming. So for example, in LP, you are given a a linear function that you want to optimize subject to some linear constraints and some non-negative constraints uh, as well uh, like and in SDP you have the similar situation but you constrain entire matrices to be a positive semi-definite. Uh, in the middle of this uh, we have another uh, lesser known uh, class of uh, co uh, convex optimization problems. They are called the second order conic uh, problems and uh, they are interesting because uh, they are bit, they are more powerful than uh, linear programs, uh, but still uh, much easier to solve than uh, semi-definite programs. And as an example of uh, such a problem, uh, we have the um, problem of uh, support vector machines. So this is one of the most important uh, problems in classical machine learning, and we can actually reduce it to uh, second-order conic programming. So in short, uh, we develop uh, an algorithm, a quantum algorithm for solving second order conic programming. Uh, and then uh, we use the reduction uh, of uh, SVMs to check this algorithm's performance on some uh, real world problems. So first, uh, I'm going to do a short uh, recap of, of linear programming. Uh, so as you see, um, here we have the primal linear program uh, on the left hand side and it's dual on the right hand side. And uh, maybe uh, the, the most interesting, uh, the most important takeaway uh, is that on the left-hand side, you have this variable X. On the right-hand side, you have two variables, Y and S, uh, but actually we are going to, uh, the important one is actually the S variable, which is the, of the same size as X, and it has the same uh, non-negativity constraints as X. So how do we solve these things? We know uh, that at the optimum, uh, at the optimal solution, uh, at the optimal primal dual solution, uh, these uh, following conditions uh, hold. And we see that. Uh, let me try to show this. Yeah. So we see that uh, these solutions must satisfy uh, primal feasibility, dual feasibility, and this peculiar condition, uh, which is called the complementary slackness condition. Uh, which actually means uh, that the element-wise product of x and s, uh, of the optimal x and s, uh, is equal to zero. So this uh, dot in a circle is actually the element-wise product. However, this system of equations is a bit too nonlinear for us to solve uh, just like that. So instead, uh, what we do, instead what we do, uh, is that we start from an, init uh, an initial solution uh, which has this element-wise product of x and s equals to 1. And then uh, we slowly reduce this constant. So we slowly uh, reduce this constant until we reach the situation uh, where uh, their element-wise product is actually equal, uh, equal or close to 0. So these, uh, these x, y, and s uh, trace a curve as we uh, change our parameter nu. And this curve is called the central path. Uh, these algorithms that follow uh, the central path, uh, they're called the uh, interior, point, interior point methods. Why? Well, because uh, during the entirety of the algorithm, we are actually following, uh, we are actually uh, moving in the interior of our feasible region. Uh, and only at the end, uh, we, are conver uh, we are converging slowly uh, to the optimal that uh, lies on the boundary of this feasible region. So how exactly uh, do we move uh, from one uh, from one point to the other on the central path. Uh, well, uh, we just perform one step of Newton's method. Uh, obviously, we need to linearize our um, uh, our complementary slackness condition. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we are able uh, by doing just this, performing one step of uh, Newton's method at a time and reducing our uh, our duality gap. Uh, we are able to slowly uh, reach the, the optimum. 
during this entire algorithm, uh, we keep uh, an invariant, and that is uh, that invariant uh, says that the element-wise product of x and s is actually equal to the duality gap. So obviously, when uh, since the duality gap decreases, uh, the element-wise product uh, decreases as well. Uh, so once we reach uh, something, uh, once the element-wise product is small, the duality gap is small as well. So uh, here you can see this whole uh, algorithm uh, in an algorithmic form. And you see that uh, the bulk of it is actually uh, spent on solving this linear system here. Uh, the specifics of uh, this linear system are not important, uh, but the, the takeaway uh, is that on one hand, the matrix here changes a bit in like all fan entries, uh, like this diagonal matrix of X, uh, of X and S, and the right hand side, uh, side changes a bit, uh, but this is also uh, easy to com compute. Uh, but obviously, because we are at a quantum conference, uh, we want a quantum algorithm. So what was the easiest thing to do? Well, we just solve this linear system here quantumly. Uh, what, does it, uh, what does it mean? Well, uh, we use uh, the well-developed uh, quantum linear algebra toolbox. Uh, some of the, uh, maybe the, the most important building block is actually the, the block encoding uh, framework. Uh, where you embed your classical, well, your data matrix, uh, your, yeah, your matrix uh, inside the big unitary. Uh, you store your, the right-hand side of your linear system in QRAM. And this allows you to uh, uh, efficiently uh, prepare the quantum state, uh, which we denote like this, uh, that uh, corresponds to the solution of this linear system AX equal to B. Uh, the complexity of doing this is uh, polylogarithmic in the dimension of uh, our linear system, but it also has some uh, dependence in uh, some other problem specific factors such as the uh, condition number of our mutant matrix. Uh, at the end, because we uh, want a classical solution of our linear system, uh, we need to do the, uh, we need to perform tomography on this uh, state corresponding to our solution. Uh, and this can also be done uh, using uh, well-known tomography algorithms. Uh, so the bulk of the analysis uh, of this algorithm here uh, goes on the fact, on the, um, goes towards proving uh, that even if we solve our linear systems approximately, everything works out uh, fine. So finally, we can uh, move on to uh, the topic of our talk, uh, that is uh, second order cones. So what are second order cones? In general, uh, in, uh, they are just uh, consist of vectors uh, whose uh, zeroth coordinate or first coordinate bounds the norm of the rest of the coordinates. Uh, so yeah, this is a typo, it should be a tilde here. Uh, but if maybe uh, it's easier to understand it through examples. Uh, so in one dimension, uh, this uh, Lorentz cone, this uh, second order cone actually reduces uh, to the set of non-negative real numbers. And in, uh, in three dimension, it uh, is actually our, this nice ice cream cone. And in four dimension, you can, um, you might uh, remember it from the special theory of relativity where it's actually the light cone. So um, in general, uh, the conic constraints in, uh, in second order conic programs actually apply to uh, blocks of, of our vectors. Uh, so, yes, we actually constrain uh, blo the blocks of our uh, variable x to be in these, uh, in these cones of various dimensions. So here you see uh, how it looks like uh, when uh, we write all of the blocks explicitly. Uh, so each of these x's is actually uh, a single, is actually a vector, a block of our big block vector x. Uh, so we see that we still have a linear uh, objective, uh, some linear constraints, and these uh, conic constraints apply to, to the blocks. Uh, we can also write this in a condensed form so that it looks even more like a linear system. Um, there are maybe two important quantities uh, in which we, um, in terms of which we state the complexity of, of such algorithms, and that is the rank of the SOCP, that's actually just the number of these cones, and the di its dimension, which is just the sum of the dimensions of, of the blocks or, or actually the dimension of, of X. Uh, 
the duality theory of, of SOCPs is uh, pretty similar to uh, the one for uh, LPs. Um, there isn't too much uh, to say, uh, there is nothing much to say about this. Uh, the main takeaway is that uh, indeed we can solve this with a classical algorithm uh, that uh, runs in time uh, square root of kind of square root of n times n to the omega uh, times the log of, uh, of the precision. So the, the main question is how do we quantize this? Well, for this we need some, some tools. Uh, just like in the LP case, uh, we had uh, we were taking some element-wise products. Here, this element-wise product uh, is replaced uh, by uh, something called the Jordan product. The exact expression is not really important. The important fact uh, is that we can actually express it as a matrix vector multiplication. Uh, and this matrix uh, corresponding uh, to our vector. So you can think about this uh, of these. Uh, you can think about these arrow matrices as the analogs of the diagonal matrices. Uh, you, the main thing is that they are actually sparse and they also have uh, all of n uh, non-zero entries in them. Of course, we can extend this to blocks, uh, so it all works out as, as you expected. And the main takeaway of, of this uh, slide is that actually uh, these arrow matrices and second order uh, cones are easy to compute with, or at least uh, are not too much harder than the, in, the, in the case of LPs. So now, uh, using these tools, uh, we can develop an, uh, a quantum interior point method for SOCPs. Uh, the only thing you need to change uh, when going from the LP to the SOCP case is that instead of this element-wise product, we maintain uh, this uh, Jordan product uh, being close to the duality gap. And now uh, the Newton system uh, is changed a bit uh, so that these uh, ones we had diagonal matrices here. Now they are replaced with these arrow matrices that are still sparse and nice. And finally, uh, this algorithm, uh, we can compute the complexity of this algorithm, which consists of, of two factors. Uh, the first of them is the iteration count, which is the same as in the classical algorithms for SLCP. And the second one uh, is um, the per iteration cost, uh, which is the combination of uh, all our linear system solving and tomography algorithms. Uh, as you see probably, uh, here we have a lot of these ugly factors of kappa, zeta, delta, and so on. Um, I wrote how some of them behave, uh, but it is not really uh, easy to prove uh, their behavior theoretically. So in order to get some feeling about how they behave, uh, we investigate them numerically on, an, on the example of uh, support vector machines. So in short, uh, what are support vector machines? Well, uh, the setup is uh, that you have a bunch of points that are labeled, for example, with blue and green, uh, and you want to uh, find the hyperplane separating these two uh, labels uh, such that the margin, this, uh, this distance here, uh, is maximized. Uh, the, the corresponding optimization problem is here. Uh, you see that it doesn't look, uh, look very uh, exciting and interesting. Uh, the only non-trivial part here uh, is actually that we have this uh, quadratic term in the norm of W. Uh, now, uh, to compute this, to embed this problem here in, uh, as, a, as an SOCP, uh, we uh, use this simple trick of constraining this, uh, this vector to be in the Lorentz cone, and we obtain an SOCP of a size that is linear in the size of our SVM. Finally, uh, we simulated the execution of our quantum uh, algorithm and compared it to state-of-the-art classical algorithms, both for solving SOCPs and support vector machines. So what we did is that we actually solved uh, our SOCP to a fixed precision, to a fixed duality gap of 0 0.1. On the other hand, we let the classical algorithms converge until the end, and we measured their uh, complexity. So for, uh, for general SOCP algorithms, we get this exponent of 3.3. .3. For uh, SVMs, we get this exponent of 3.1. And for our quantum algorithms, uh, when we uh, actually substitute the numerical values of, our, of these parameters, uh, we get this complexity of uh, 2.59. Uh, here, uh, you see the effects uh, of having this low precision, uh, of having this low precision uh, so the effects of uh, only solving our SOCP to a low precision, uh, ideally, uh, so these graphs, uh, they show the distribution uh, of the difference between the uh, accuracy of uh, our, of the, quantum SO, uh, of the quantum SVMs and the state of, and the classical methods. So ideally we would want to have a delta function here. Uh, realistically, we can all, only hope for uh, 
and these graphs to not be too far to the left. And that is uh, indeed the case. So for the majority of instances, uh, depending on, on what exactly you compare, the difference in the accuracy uh, between the quantum algorithm and the exact classical algorithms are, is not too high. So to conclude, uh, this shows uh, that our quantum algorithm actually achieves a polynomial speed up uh, for uh, solving some low precision SOCPs. Uh, in particular, uh, we consider the case of uh, uh, SVMs, where we observe a polynomial speed up and a negligible loss in accuracy. Uh, it's worth noting that SVMs are not the only application. Uh, we have applied this approach to solving uh, constrained portfolio optimization problems, uh, which can also be reduced to SOCPs. And we also observe some uh, polynomial speed up there. Maybe one open question uh, is whether we can improve upon this uh, by using uh, more advanced uh, quantum linear algebra alg algorithms, such as uh, this L-infinity uh, tomography for our uh, vectors. So yeah, that would be it. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thanks so much, Daniel, for this really interesting talk. Um, we have a couple of questions already in Slack. The first one comes from Jacinta May, which is a question for clarification. Um, mm -hmm. She says, I may have missed this, but how do you represent the running time for SOCP algorithms? And what represent the running time? Uh, well, the classical running time uh, is just this. So uh, you can think about it uh, as a polynomial in, in our dimension uh, times some uh, logarithm of the precision. And in our case, uh, we have still uh, kind of the same uh, iteration count uh, plus uh, the, ah, sorry, uh, maybe, maybe I misunderstood the, the question. Uh, so uh, by complexity, I just mean uh, the, the number of gates plus uh, the, the time complexity of, of the quantum and the classical algorithms. Maybe that is the best answer I can give. Um, James Cruz is asking, next question. James Cruz is asking whether you could give some examples of application areas where SOCP uh, crops up. Uh, huh, where SOCPs bind them. Uh, so I am not, I don't think I'm aware of any areas where SOCP, where uh, you are required to solve general uh, SOCPs. Uh, most often uh, you use them by, uh, by the way of reducing some other problem uh, to them. It is known that you can reduce quadratic programs to them. And uh, we all know that quadratic programs uh, have, have a lot of applications. There are some applications, I think, in, uh, in structural design and in antenna design and uh, areas like this. Uh, but I'm not really familiar with the specifics. Um, great. And there's another question for, uh, from Jacinta May, who asks, what mm -hmm. do you think this result could mean for quantum optimization applications? Well, uh, so this uh, algorithm is an example where we show that, um, yes, indeed, uh, it is possible to use, uh, it is possible to achieve some uh, uh, reasonable uh, speed ups uh, when, when using these uh, quantum optimization algorithms. Uh, the, the thing is that uh, there are many, there is a great deal of work uh, being done on quantum optimization, both on LPs, on SDPs, and even on SOCPs. Uh, but there is always this lingering question of whether this is going to actually to give us uh, a real world speed up, whether these fact uh, with these unknown uh, problem specific parameters actually explode or not. So I think this is a good example of a problem uh, where, uh, where we see that it all works out and that we actually do get a speed up. Um, there's another question which is very similar to the one James asked, so maybe you mm -hmm. can, you can Go into Slack and maybe clarify. Yeah, let's see. And um, we have, but we have another uh, mm -hmm. later, but we, um, we have another minute. So I was uh, going to ask. So um, do you still need to um, load your classical data into QRAM, right? And have you accounted for the cost of that? Yeah. Uh, so this is this is a big uh, well remark uh, that relates to all of these uh, QRAM based optimization algorithms. Uh, we kind of assume that our data is originally given in QRAM. Obviously, if, if it's not, you, you do have to load it uh, to QRAM. So you are going to pay the price of actually going through this data and uh, paying a logarithmic price uh, per, per entry, per non-zero entry. So m maybe even like that, it's, it's not too big of a price to pay. 
Great, uh, thank you so much. Um, and thanks for all the great questions. And we have claps piling up in Slack. <laughs> Uh, do continue the discussion there over lunch. Um, the next talk uh, will start at 3 p.m. London time um, by John van der uh, Vettering. Um, and yeah, thank you so much to the speakers of the session. Uh, lovely talks and bye-bye. Uh, See you soon. Thank you.